Alright guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous, it is a rainy night, hallelujah. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, we did have some water falling from the sky. Come up here and join us for this rant, y'all yeah, cat. The cat is thinking about joining us for the rant. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Are you coming up or not? Nacho says, we don't need another cat up here like that. Anyway, it is a lovely Tuesday night. That would be August 30th, 2022, and I've actually had this sitting around since Sunday. I was going to make this my Sunday sermon, but I have been so busy at working on that tiny house. So anyway, I feel like sometimes, you know, trying to figure out which aspect of the collapse of civilization and the planet that we leave nuclear out. And uh, so we're going to uh, turn our attention to the mushroom cloud possibility of human extinction and collapse of everything. Good old counterpunch. I think Jeffrey St. Clair is one of the main editors there, and this is his column, Roaming Charges, Nuclear Midnight's Children, and I'll put the link on here, and uh, you can read this yourself, or you can sit here and listen to me read it, and the cat joining in. Okay. He starts out with a quote from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I don't think I've ever quoted Samuel here. Quote, is it possible that such minds are fit to govern? And with that question, we will dive into this. As one of the world's largest and most troubled nuclear power facilities has become a radioactive pawn in an increasingly savage and internecine war, the atomic clock is about as close to ringing midnight as it can get. Yet, most of the world seems to be sleeping, or sleepwalking soundly, either unaware or unruffled by the immediacy of the peril in Ukraine. How can this be? After cowering under the nuclear menace for nearly eight decades, after Trinity, Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the big blast at Novaya Zemlya, Amchitka, and the Marshall Islands, after the radioactive disasters at Church Rock, Three Mile Island, Rocky Flats, Chernobyl, Hanford, and Fukushima. I have to admit that I didn't, uh, I, I don't recognize about half of those myself. Uh, how can a demonic technology that has left only death, destruction, environmental ruin, cancer, sterility, well, okay, good for nuclear, good for nuclear, sterility, and genetic mutation as its legacy be treated so cavalierly by so many? We have reached the point now where even Oliver Stone is pushing the virtues of nuclear power despite its inextricable ties with the military industrial complexes complex that he has assailed most of his career. In large measure this dismal state of affairs is the consequence of the deepening fractures in the global environmental movement, hmm, a large swath of which has desperately embraced nuclear power as an atomic shield, dubious though it will prove to be against cataclysmic climate change. The emerging compact between the nuclear industry and some high-profile environmentalist is surely one of the most surreal and treacherous alliances 
of our time. Freelance nuclear shills such as the odious <laughs> the, the odious James Hansen and the clownish George Monbiot have left carbon footprints that would humble Godzilla by jetting across the world promoting nuclear energy as a kind of technological deus ex machina for the apocalyptic threat of climate change. That uh, term, I guess that's how you pronounce, is it a deus ex machina or machina? Uh, you know, it's that, uh, I think what they're talking about, if I remember my film study school, is where like in the middle of some cheesy movie when, you know, when the hero's back is against the wall and he's getting ready to get beheaded or whatever, and, and then some just uh, completely out of left field bullshit comes in, you know, to save the day. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I think that's what that term means. <clears throat> Promoting nuclear energy as a kind of technological deus ex machina for the apocalyptic threat of climate change. Hansen has gone so far as to charge that, quote, opposition to nuclear power threatens the future of humanity, close quote. Yes, it is opposition to nuclear power that threatens the future of humanity. Thank you, James Hansen. Shamefully, many Greens, you, you know, I would call them Greenies, shamefully, many Greenies now promote nuclear power as a kind of ecological lesser evilism. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of rationalization for the doomsday machines. The survival of nuclear power has always depended on the willing suspension of disbelief. In the terrifying post-Hiroshima age, most people intuitively detected the symb symbiotic linkage between nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and those fears had to be doused. As a consequence, the nuclear industrial complex con concocted the fairy tale of the peaceful atom, zealously promoted by one of the most devious con men of our time, Edward H. Baum Teller. After ratting out Robert Oppenheimer as a peacenik and security risk, Teller set up shop in the lair at the Lawrence Livermore Labs and rapidly began designing uses for nuclear power and bombs as industrial engines to propel the post-World War II economy. One of the first mad schemes to come off of Teller's drafting board was Operation Chariot, a plan to excavate a deep water harbor at Cape, at Cape Thornton near the Inuit village of Point, Point, Point Hope, Alaska, by using controlled, parentheses, SIC, detonations of hydrogen bombs. Yes. That is one way to excavate a harbor, yes, using controlled detonation of hydrogen bombs. <clears throat> In night it, anyway, guys, uh, it, it, it gets, th this is a long article, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun, but uh, if you want, you, you have to go on the link. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, this uh, he has several things in here, so I guess I can. I, 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 he goes off into other subjects after his nuclear rant, so I guess we can uh, stick with this one. Okay, so in 1958, Teller, 
who was the real life model for Terry Southern's character, Dr. Strangelove, devised a plan for atomic fracking, atomic fracking, with the Richfield Oil Company, Teller plotted to detonate 100 atomic bombs in northern Alberta to extract oil from the tar sands. That plan, which went by the name Project Oil Sands, was only quashed when intelligence agencies got word that Soviet spies had infiltrated the Canadian oil industry. I don't know where he's getting this information, uh, this wild tale. Uh, I'm assuming it's true. He doesn't quote or footnote any of this stuff. Frustrated by the Canadians' failure of nerve, Teller soon turned his attention to the American West. First, he tried to sell the water-hungry Californians on a scheme to explode more than 20 nuclear bombs to carve a trench in the western Sacramento Valley to canal more water to San Francisco. The original blueprint for Jerry Brown's peripheral canal, this was followed by a plot to blast off 22 peaceful nukes. 22 peaceful nukes to blow a hole in the Bristol Mountains of Southern California for the construction of Interstate 40. Fortunately, neither plan came to fruition. Teller once again turned to the oil industry with a scheme to liberate natural gas buried under the Colorado Plateau by setting off 30 kiloton nuclear bombs 6,000 feet below the surface of the Earth. Te Teller vowed that these mantle-cracking explosions marketed as Project Gas Buggy would, quote, stimulate the flow of natural gas the gas was indeed stimulated, but it also turned out to be highly radioactive. So I guess they, they actually uh, tried that one. More crucially, in 1957, at a speech before the American Chemical Society, Teller, who later helped the Israelis develop their nuclear weapons program, became the first scientist to posit that the burning of fossil fuels would inevitably yield a climate-altering greenhouse effect, which would feature megastorms, prolonged droughts, and melting ice caps. His solution? Replace the energy created by coal and gas-fired plants with a global network of nuclear power plants. Edward Teller's deranged ideas of yesteryear have now been dusted off and remarketed by the nuclear greens, the nuclear greens, including James Lovelock, the originator of the Gaia hypothesis, with no credit given to their heinous progenitor. There are currently 460 or so operating nukes, some chugging along far past their expiration dates. Can you say Diablo Canyon in California? I remember being a reporter living in California in the early 1980s where uh, they were, you know, trying to shut down Diablo uh, nuclear, you know, that sits on an earthquake fault there in San Luis Obispo, California, sitting there on an earthquake fault. In the early 1980s, 
they were trying to shut that damn thing down. And here we are in 2022, just waiting for that earthquake. And now I guess uh, that Save the Planet Governor Newsom is uh, apparently going to sign off to let it chug along for a few more years until an earthquake finally takes care of it and, you know, wipes Southern California off the map. So where are we? There are currently 460 or so operating nukes, some chugging along far past their expiration dates, coughing up 10% of global energy demands. Teller's green disciples want to see nuclear power's total share swell to 50% which would mean the construction of roughly 2,100 new atomic water boilers from Mogadishu to Kathmandu. What are the odds of all those cracking up without a hitch? I guess we will find out what the odds are of all those cranking up without a hitch. And I guess that's the end of that. Then he goes off into that student loan crap, that distraction. He spends more time on student loans than he does on a uh, than he does on nuclear power. Uh, anything else? Uh, in here worth men mentioning. Uh, here's one, uh, just a short one. From Ferdinand Mount's review of In the Shadow of the Gods, the Emperor in World History by Dominic Livin. Quote, The overwhelming impact of most empires was thumpingly military, not aristocratic or religious, and certainly not democratic. In the early 12th century, over four-fifths of the Song government budget, whatever... I have no idea, never heard of the Song government in my entire life, went to maintain an army of more than a million men. In Augustus's reign, roughly half the state budget went to the armed forces supporting 300,000 troops. The million-strong armies of the 20th century and now 21st century have plenty of precedents. Yeah. So this, you know, his roaming charges. Um, you know, he touches on a a uh, bunch of stuff. How much will it cost you to have a candlelit dinner with Donald Trump in New Jersey? How about $100,000? $100,000 buys you a candlelit dinner with Donald Trump on September 14th. Um, let's see. Man, he's uh, he's really on it. Uh, he is all over the place. Then he gets into gun violence. Uh, man, this man, he is roaming. Well, anyway, then he goes off blasting Ron DeSantis. It's uh, easy to pick. Good Lord, this man uh, this week. 
Uh, you could go on and on. Uh, anything uh, germane to the Doomosphere here. Uh, here's the collapse of emergency health care in England. I like this quote on Corona Panic from Jacob Silverman. Someday we're going to look back on this whole Corona Panic disaster and laugh because we will all have 40% of our original brain matter and can barely process reality. Yep. Great picture of Joe Biden, and then of course uh, he gets into the Chinese drought. Good Lord, oh, I think we know about that. Meanwhile, in some regions of Somalia, it has not rained in more than two years. Uh, Alright, what's going on with drilling? in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Drilling in, in Anwar was always going to be a risky economic proposition, which is why major oil companies declined to submit any bids when Trump pushed through a lease sale in 2021. Now the only two remaining private companies with plans to drill in Anwar have canceled their leases. That leaves Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, a state agency, as the last leaseholder in the refuge. The agency now holds seven leases covering about 370,000 acres uh, in the refugee's 1.6 million acre coastal plain. Yep, here's the Rio Grande River uh, drying up. Meanwhile, Dallas uh, is underwater. Uh, all right, methane getting a mention uh, from Mr. St. Clair. Nearly one-third Nearly one-third of the rise in global temperatures can be attributed to methane. Atmospheric methane had its highest growth rate yet recorded by modern instruments in 2020. Of course, that record was broken again in 2021, and I don't mind adding it will be broken again in 2022 that there will be more methane uh, going off this year than any year probably in human history. Um, all right. What is uh, going on with Global Forest Watch? According to a new report from Global Forest Watch, forest fires are now causing 7.4 million acres of tree cover loss per year, an area larger than Belgium, and 50% more than 2021. Uh, I think, yeah, we talked about that on Manga Bay. Uh, And of course, he had to get in some digs with Herschel Walker. Uh, here is. <laughs> anyway, good lord, this. Uh, there's more stuff on fracking. Uh, Good Lord, this man. Then uh, he has a lot on who Samuel Coleridge is. I don't think there's any end to this. Uh, 
I will say Jeffrey St. Clair has uh, been doing his homework. Uh, anyway, you can. I will put the link in here, and you can. Uh, And you can look at this herself. He's giving his reading list. Uh, what he's listening to. About Strange Time to Be Alive. The Basic Problem. Okay. He ends with the basic problem, but uh, you have to go on here to find out what the basic problem is if you don't already know. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up, and we're going to head over to Netflix to continue watching Skinwalker Ranch to uh <laughs> to while away the collapse. Yes, little dog. Is there something you want? I want you to wrap up this rant. Call it a night. Uh my guys. Well that turned out longer than I thought. I did not know that Jeffrey St. Clair I uh, had written a uh, a novel this week.